Hello, here we are again, along with our friend Swami Rama and Sadhana, and today we're talking about kleshas. The title of this section has is, have, you, sorry, you have to become mindful of the kleshas. You have to become mindful of the clashes. Very, very well chosen words. We have to do this. We need to be aware of the five clashes. Here we go. The purpose of the practice of Kriya Yoga is to remove the clashes. The clashes are the cause of dukkham. Pain, worry, misery, and suffering. Hello, Anjin. It's a little a little quiet here today. There's a couple more who have not said hello, so I don't know who here is here with us, Anjin. The clashes are the cause of dukkham, pain, worry, misery, and suffering. They hinder your progress and present prevent you from attaining samadhi. Patanjali says, in order to understand the philosophy of the clashes, you have to understand four basic principles of yoga. There is pain and misery. There is a cause of pain and misery. There are ways and means to get freedom from pain. There is a state that is free from all pains. Hello, Arban. And Miranda. Hello, Miranda. Buddhism borrowed these ideas from yoga science and teaches the same thing. Buddha was born as a prince in a Hindu family. He had all possible worldly means, a beautiful wife, a palace, a big kingdom, a strong and healthy body, and he was a very handsome man like Christ. He left his home when he became aware that there was suffering in the world. Surprise, surprise, surprise. In the practice of Kriya Yoga, this word Kriya Yoga is in the first sutra of chapter two of the Yoga Sutras. The title of this text we're, we're going from is Sadhana, and it's based on Sadhana Pada. Pada means foot, and so what we know as chapters. So there's four chapters, four feet to the Yoga Sutras, and Pada too is named Sadhana Pada. And so the very first principle that's introduced there is of Kriya Yoga being four principles, Tapas, Vajay, Ishvara, Pranadana, Kriya Yoga. And there is Matri popped up. Hi, Matri. He left his home when he became aware that there was suffering in the world, Buddha that is. In the practice of Kriya Yoga, first you should acknowledge there is pain and that you suffer on account of pain. You cannot ignore pain or pretend there is no misery or pain. Every human being feels pain, and sometimes the cause of pain is unknown. Pain can come from external sources or from one's own physical, mental, or spiritual limitations. For instance, you may have the desire to attain the highest truth, but when you find you are not able to attain it, you become depressed. And look there, oh my. Hi, Maya. The word klesha, the word klesha 
is often misinterpreted to mean evil, devil, or sin because of common belief in these notions. Patanjali says those who propagate these ideas do so in order to keep people under their control, just as a horse rider uses a stick and his heels to guide a horse on the right track. Those persons who are not educated and do not want to or do not have the capacity to understand can be controlled by the suggestive power of such ideas as the devil and sin. For them, the terror and fear associated with these things are helpful. In reality, there is no need to worry about going to heaven or hell. You create your own personal heaven or hell, and demons are also self-made. The devil is a sickness of the mind, as are so many physiological diseases, which can be controlled by mental focus. Nothing can be more injurious than the human mind, for it is capable of creating disasters of the highest magnitude. The capacity of the human mind to create an atom bomb and drop it to destroy a whole country is evidence of the destructive potential of the human mind. Literal interpretations of the concepts of the devil and sin are not for an educated person who is looking for answers to the vital questions of life. And obviously not everybody would agree with these principles. From where have I come? Why have I come? What is the purpose of my life? Where am I going? In religious books, scriptures, and t or teachers, if religious books, scriptures, or teachers cannot satisfactorily explain these vital questions or give you the answers, you have to look elsewhere. Try to explore your origin and understand what you are, how and why you have come to this world, and what the purpose of your life is. In this way, you will gradually become aware of the higher dimensions of life, and you will question more. What is the source of knowledge? From where can I receive this knowledge? What are those obstacles that come in the way and, pre and prevent me from having clarity of mind and the knowledge that can help me to attain the highest state of freedom from misery? If you study the book of Psalms or the Sermon on the Mount, you will not find any mention of sin. These scriptures are meant for those who have more understanding and have started to question life. In the Sermon on the Mount, Christ did not say you would go to hell if you committed sins. Instead, he said, you are like a child. You have all the potentials, and if you continue to grow, you will become like your father. You and your father are one. Although the major religious traditions of the world talk about sin, there is confusion about what sin actually is. No one is a sinner, but you frequently commit mistakes and thus create many obstacles for yourself. In desperation, you pray to the Lord for help. And there is Vowder, why the duchies are winning again. You have quite a team over there, Ma. Hi, Walter. But that's okay. Duchies are fun. In desperation, you pray to the Lord for help. You may feel inspired when you pray, but otherwise you may remain ignorant. For example, if you decide you are no longer going to work, 
you may spend the whole day praying to God to give you food. If someone comes and takes pity on you, you think God has answered your prayers. But actually, God has not sent you any food. Someone gave you the food because they felt pity on you. Patanjali says to be realistic and not to create obstacles for yourself. Even if you cannot have control over your mind in its thinking process, you can try to have control over your actions and speech. Go Dutchies, says Ma. There's the cheerleader. Go Dutchies. I'll cheer along with you. Go Dutchies. There we go. All right. Thank you for the cheerleading, Ma. Now, where was I? Even if you cannot have control over your mind and its thinking process, you can try to have control over your actions and speech. You can make effort to stop saying what you don't want to say and stop doing those things that are not helpful. Patanjali describes those things that are not helpful for you as clashes or obstacles. You have to become mindful of the clashes. Patanjali clarifies this concept by explaining the five categories of clashes. Avidya, ignorance or lack of awareness of the reality. Asmita, sense of egoism. Raga, attachment towards the things of the world. Devesha, repulsion. And Abhinivesha, strong desire for life or abject fear of death. These are the great afflictions, the causes of all misery. Moksha is final emancipation from all the clashes and all pain and suffering. There may be times you feel so happy and joyous that you think you are free from all pains and miseries and have fulfilled all your karmic duties. But there are some scars, the subtle impressions of past actions deeply hidden in the reservoir of the unconscious that can suddenly come forward to remind you that you are not yet free. Not yet, huh? They are stronger than the superficial events happening on the surface, and they do not allow you to go forward. You may have decided the world is of no use to you, and have renounced your home and finally joined a monastery. If you, if you try to go back to the world, the world will kick you again and let you know there is no place for you in society. Even if you have accepted all of this, still those deep-rooted samskars will come and disturb you again and again. The following story will demonstrate how this can happen. It's a pretty long story here, but as I remember, it's a pretty good one. Yeah, there we go. Once there was a Swami whose guru had asked him not to have anything to do with three things, gold, the charms and temptations of beautiful women, and name and fame. His master warned him these three things were very powerful and told him if he could avoid them, enlightenment would, would definitely come. So he solemnly promised his master he would not be tempted. But he did not realize what a difficult task he had been given. As Swami Ramatirtha, a great sage from the Himalayas, had said, when I needed the world, name, and fame, and money, it's 10, nothing came to me. But the day I renounced them, they started to follow me. Fortune is like a flirt. 
she runs away from him who runs after her and runs after him who runs away from her. Hmm. So the Swami went on his way until he came to a river. He could see that a segment of the bank of the river had collapsed, revealing three golden vessels full of gold coins. He reminded himself of his master's orders and pondered the situation. Ponder, ponder, ponder. I am a Swami, so I don't need you. Why did you never come to me when I needed you? But now that you are here, I shall make use of you anyway. With this gold, I will build a temple with a big hall where people can assemble for satsang. Many Swamis can come and teach there. This is something good. And since I am not doing it for myself, it is okay. You hear the setup coming? Hi, Jeff. The setup is coming. Immediately, he set out to get help for this project. He asked two contractors to come to the site where he had decided the temple should be built and said to them, I need your assistance. I am a Swami, so I cannot touch gold. I'm requesting you to take this gold and build a temple on this site. Please ask the architect to come. Not able to believe their good fortune, the contractors walked away from the Swami and conspired to cheat him. One of them said, no one cares for this Swami. He has left the world so nobody will notice if he dies. Let us drown him in the river, and then we can share this wealth. The other contractor readily agreed. They walked back to the Swami, and before he could realize what was happening, they attacked him. Then they had a big rock. Then they tied a big rock to his neck and threw him in the river. To relieve themselves of any guilt feelings, they told each other he deserved that. And without any further concern, they happily walked away with all the gold. Poor Swami's drowning. Fortunately for that Swami, his master was closely looking after him. As soon as the contractors were out of sight, he appeared and cut the rope and pulled him from the river. Then he scolded him for not keeping his promise. The Swami protested that he had not gone against his word since he had not intended to use the gold for himself. His master told him he should not have gotten involved with the gold at all. And so the Swami assured his master it would never happen again. After this incident, when after this incident, when anybody offered him money, he would turn his face away and refuse it. He returned to the forest, determined to continue his sadhana. A woman who was a widow saw that he was alone and took pity on him. She approached him and asked, Sir, can I give you some milk from a distance? Yes, as long as you don't come near me. Keep it over there. From that day, she started to bring him milk every day, gradually placing the milk closer and closer to the Swami. Boy, you can see this one coming, huh? The Swami had confidence that she was a good person, so he did not reproach her. Again, one day she spoke to him, Sir, how can you sit the whole day? It doesn't seem possible. I could never do that. Your legs must be paining you. Perhaps you would like me to press your legs. Without hesitation, he agreed. After a few days, she started to live with him. And when two people live together, something is bound to happen. 
the child arrived after some time. One day the Swami was carrying the child on his shoulders and the child urinated on him. A Swami who was passing by saw what happened and he shouted, Hey, what's the matter, Swami? Is it the juice of the Gita that is flowing from your shoulders? Pretty sarcastic, isn't it? This incident shocked him back to his senses, and he said to the woman, You have enough wealth to look after the child. Now let me go so I can complete my sadhana, as I am not yet realized. She knew he was determined and so did not try to prevent him from going. He left and went further into the deep forest, vowing to never again allow money or any woman to distract him from his sadhana, but his troubles were not over. And let's keep in mind here that the story here is that it's his attachment that is the problem. This is not a story blaming women for men, as it seems to be popular in some circles. It's not what this story is. One day, a villager came to him to ask for money for the marriage ceremony of his daughter. He pleaded with the Swami to help him. In response, the Swami pulled out one hair from his beard, gave it to the man, and said, if you put this in a safe place, your supply of money will never be exhausted. But don't tell anyone about it or that I have given it to you. Of course, when the villager returned to his home, he was so excited he could not refrain from telling his wife what had happened. Since the woman could not keep such exciting news in her heart, everybody eventually came to know about it. The story became known even in faraway places. As a result, many people came to him and pulled hairs out of his beard until his whole face was bleeding. See, I don't have a beard, besides which I don't know how to do that anyway, so I'm safe. This is how the Swami came to be the victim of the third forbidden item, name and fame. The inherent desire for name and fame was the immediate cause, but there were also deep-rooted samskaras. When this Swami renounced his home and family, he did so under the illusion that he would be free. Patanjali says a false renunciation is not the way to freedom. You cannot live perfectly until you remove the cause of all the clashes that are deeply rooted in the unconscious. Without rooting out the cause, the effect of the cause will remain, and you will continue to reap the fruits of your actions. And until you understand the cause, you will not be able to help yourself. If you are performing a karma and action, and do not know why you are doing that particular action, that karma will continue to motivate you to, re to repeat it. You will be like a machine or a robot, living a mindless life. If you chop down a tree, unless you remove all the roots of that tree, after some time, many branches will again start to come out of the tree stump. Sometimes you may think you have conquered your internal states, but without rooting out all the causes, you will not be able to control your destiny. Now you can understand the importance of the first aphorism of the second pada. In this aphorism, Patanjali is expressing the significance of the practice of Kriya Yoga to help you remove the clashes and to deal with the difficulties you have to face in removing them. This is sadhana pada, so you have to be very practical now. There is no need to become a philosopher, but you have to be very clear. Even when you think you have completed your karma, 
there are certain clashes of which you are not aware, and you will still have to deal with these latent clashes that are deeply rooted in your unconscious. They will make their presence known to you. You may find that suddenly you are begin being controlled or forced to do something that distracts your whole course of life and completely shatters you. And look who showed uh, Oh, Chas showed up too. Hi, Chas. And hi, Johnny. That's I saw Johnny, then I saw Chas. Johnny is here to play. You cannot easily get rid of the clashes because they are deeply intertwined with your karma. Even when you go from this world, you will carry all the seeds of your karmas with you. Whenever the opportunity comes, again, you will come forward and repeat the same karmas in another lifetime. Patanjali says by performing your karma skillfully and selflessly, you can cross the mires of delusion and get freedom from the painful cycle of deaths and births. You have to be reborn again as long as you have desires or karma to fulfill. And desire always brings pain instead of joy because all the joys of the world are mingled with pain. Patanjali says the root cause of karma is in the kleshas. The kleshas arise from attachment to the body, which has its source in the union of Purusha with Prakriti. This attachment to the body is so strong that no matter how much pain you experience from this attachment, still you remain attached. Here, Purusha refers to you, me, and all other individual souls. I'm not talking about Purusha as pure consciousness. Your Purusha is individual consciousness that sees and experiences through Prakriti. Ultimately, that individual Purusha is the universal Purusha, but we experience it as the individual. In the same way as a metaphor, we experience ourselves as an individual wave, even though we may know that intellectually that I am one with the ocean. It's that kind of thing. So he's being, again, he's being very practical here. Purusha and Prakriti are two forms of the same thing. And I'll add here, this is one of the points where you can hear intellectuals really get into tremendous intellectual debates over this point. Some will say, I absolutely despise Patanjali in that Yoga Sutras, in that Sankhya philosophy, because I am a Vedantin, and to me it's all Advaita, it's non-dual reality, and say these people are dual dualists because they talk about Purusha and Prakriti, as if these are different different things, and they are not different. Now, some people think they are different, and that's the right of people to do, but that's not the pr principle that's being communicated us to us here. It's not the principle of this tradition. Let everybody do and believe what they want. Here, the emphasis is extremely, extremely practical. There appears to be an individual me consciousness, does there not? and it appears to get entangled with all of the manifestations of property. So since it is appearing to function in that way, let us learn to deal with it. That's the principle that's being talked about here. Purusha and property are two forms of the same thing. This is, this is coming out of the voice of one that says, you know, that this apparent dualism of yoga and Sankhya is not separate from the apparent monism of, of Vedanta. They are not separate from one another. Just as water can exist in three forms, vapor, solid, and liquid, energy has two forms, energy itself and matter. Matter can be converted into energy and energy can be converted into matter. The most superficial or dimmest aspect of pure consciousness is prakriti, which is nature or matter, 
while Purusha is energy or consciousness. Each has a particular role to play. Instead of playing the role it was meant to play to become aware of the center of pure consciousness, Purusha has become caught up in a different role because it identifies with the objects of the world. Purusha should be able to see more clearly through Prakriti, but it does not because it remains in a condition of intoxication due to its union with Prakriti. Purusha will be able to see the absolute, capital A, absolute, only when it learns not to identify with the objects of Prakriti or the manifested world. This is the technique Purusha has to understand. We simply must understand this principle. That's me speaking. Then the question comes, why did Purusha and Prakriti come together? Purusha came in touch with Prakriti for improvement for his own sake or so he could see, or so he could see more and more. But instead of seeing more and more, he got lost in the world and forgot the reality. This is why Purusha suffers. There are two principles of life, the female principle and the male principle. Here we're entering into Tantra, another Another tricky, tri tricky point here because many, many people see over here is yoga and Sankhya and over there is Vedanta and over there is Tantra and those three are separate things. That is not what we're reading here. It is not the orientation of this tradition. Let everybody do whatever he or she wants to do. But here uh, there's, there's this orientation. There are two principles of life, the female principle and the male principle. Purusha's union with Prakriti is the union of the male principle with the female principle. It is not easy to explain why these two want to come together, nor is it possible to convince the male and female they should not come together. It is simply their nature to identify with each other. Tantric literature is devoted to the study of the male and female principles and refers to these principles in the manifest world as Shiva and Shakti, respectively. If you study Tantric literature, you will understand why these two principles are needed in the manifest world. Patanjali says, by, con by constant awareness of the reality, you will get freedom from all the clashes. There are ways of getting freedom from pains and miseries, and there is a state that is free from all miseries. One of these ways is the practice of Kriya Yoga. The three principles of Kriya Yoga, Tapas Vajaya Isvara Pranadana, austerity, self-study, and surrender to the Lord will help you remove the five clashes. Once you conquer your initial, I'm sorry, once you conquer your internal states, you will attain the highest state of samadhi, the state of tranquility or consciousness that Patanjali describes. The nature of pure consciousness is, get ready, Ma, freedom from pain and misery. It is not affected by the clashes. However, when you practice, you are as certain to encounter the clashes. We just naturally run into these clashes. There's no, there's no avoiding it. So we have to deal with them and see what's going on. Okie dokie. So that's the end of that section. To be continued. You want a little cliffhanger for the next time we come together in a few days and continue this? The cliffhanger is no like listen to this carefully. Know that you do not know. Know that you do not know. Boy, there is a free for you, huh? Went off the page, Ma. Free. There's the silence after the free, like the silence after the om, huh? 
So isn't this fun? This is so juicy, good stuff. Isn't, I enjoy going through this in this kind of way. It's thought-provoking, isn't it? And it's sadhana-provoking, even more, more important than thought-provoking. It's sadhana-provoking. I, I, just, I just want to now be quiet. So that's what I'm going to do, if that's okay. I'm going to be quiet for a little while here. Okay. Thank you all for visiting. If you can, if you can do it now, go give yourself also a little quiet time and let this business of the clashes sink in. And for just a minute or two, be allow yourself to be relatively or somewhat free from all of the clashes. Why not? Why not? Why not just do that for a minute or two or three or something like that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for visiting and playing. I hope you're enjoying this. I'm enjoying it. And I appreciate that you're coming and hanging out too. And the Dutchies won again, more Dutchies. But we're not keeping score. Dutchies are nice people. They allow everybody to be, to pretend to be Dutchies. When I'm with the Dutchies, they allow me to be an honorary Dutchie. I think it's kind of sweet, actually. But they are not literally Dutchies. That's one of those Klesha things. That's hard to accept, isn't it, Ma? Huh? My, isn't that hard to accept? I am not a Dutchie. Dutchie is not who I am. Oh, my, my, my. Whatever will I do now? Be Atman, be Purusha. I am not a duchy, I am Purusha. How's that? There's a good koan, a good mantra to think of or something like that. Anyway, I'm going to push the button now. Roseanne is not here, but Matri is lurking in the background there, about ready to tell me to push the button. Push the button. So I'm going to push the button. Thank you all for playing. Have a wonderful, wonderful next meditation, okay? And let it be a glimpse of freedom from the clashes, okay? Aham Brahmasmi, Aham Brahmasmi. That's good. That seems to be true, too. Okay. Bye-bye, all.